type in the code to gain entry into the main part of the facility. I see her sitting in one of the chairs directly across from the nurse's station. This is where the action is, all hustle and bustle. My grandmother sits and takes it all in, sometimes mumbling, sometimes drifting off into a cat nap. I slowly acclimate to the, smell, the strong smell of disinfectant as I walk down the hall toward her. Will she know my name today? I wonder. Before she sees me, I admire the smooth skin that has benefited from both genes and cosmetic surgery. I notice the gray roots growing in longer, was showing less and less of her shiny brown hair, which would have horrified her only a few months prior. I stop in front of her, and I lean down to look into the brown eyes that are now milky and often distant. It takes her a moment, but she studies my face, registers, and voices her familiar, soft, hi, honey. I give her a hug and ask her how she's doing as I pull up a chair. There are wild stories of corporate takeovers, trips overseas, cousins and other relatives long dead. There are days she barely talks at all and days she won't stop talking. It's the talkative days that are the easiest. I can hold her hand and nod my head and ask her questions about her boss and ask her about the drama at the office. The day she's quiet, I talk to her. I talk about my kids. I talk about our trip to Italy we took as a family three years prior, and I talk about my wedding. Some of it she can absorb, some of it confuses her, and some she ignores. It's the last year of my grandmother's life. I am my grandmother's conservator, court appointed due to a family battle over her care. My grandmother, I called her Graham, was living in a 24-hour lockdown, 24 lockdown facility after a sudden onset of Parkinson's-related dementia, known as Lewy Body Syndrome. When I say sudden, I mean that one day I was helping her move into her new apartment, and a week later, she was calling 911, screaming in fear about someone getting shot on her porch. The hallucinations kept getting worse, and we, her family, became increasingly desperate. After multiple 911 calls, a couple of ER visits, a month of taking care of her at my parents' house, where we had to duct tape the front door at night to ward off escapes, we found a place for her to live and be cared for. The facility Graham lived in during that last year of her life had two wings, one for the bad off and one for the really bad. The wing that was now Graham's home had few restrictions but for the locked perimeter. Access out was only granted for those of us who knew the code. Graham spent many hours those first few months loping around the hallways and grounds. Often I'd arrive for a visit and have to spend a considerable amount of time tracking her down. Driving the hour from my home to visit her or take her to doctor's appointments became a normal part of my routine. I sat with her for hours and hours throughout the course of that year. When she fell and broke her hip, I sat with her overnight in the hospital after staff told me they would put her in restraints if she showed signs of being agitated. As she progressively became more frail, I and other family members brought milkshakes with added protein powder to every visit. Her favorite was peach. Eventually it came time to move her to the other wing. One morning I fed her oatmeal and was shocked to get the phone call three hours later that she had passed away. It's hard not to talk about Graham's story without it seeming really tragic. You see, Graham's entry into the world had been nearly as rough as her exit. Born on April Fool's Day, she often shared that she was born 12 pounds and bottom first. She always joked that that's why her mother didn't like her very much. She lived through poverty and abuse of childhood, a husband at 18 who went off to Iwo Jima and came back broken, a beloved brother who died at age 24, and another brother who was imprisoned after killing his wife. She raised two daughters and a niece while living with depression and an alcoholic husband. The thing is, despite these sad truths about Graham's life from birth to death, there were so many amazing parts to it, at least from the vantage point of her granddaughter. Many of my first memories were holidays with family, Graham baking and cooking in a busy, bustling kitchen. When I was about seven years old, she left my grandfather after 30 years of marriage and started over. I remember very clearly standing in the kitchen of her nearly bare, bare apartment, and I asked her if we could bake cookies. She smiled and said, no, honey, I don't bake cookies anymore. 
She didn't, nor did she ever cook a big holiday meal again. But when she fell in love again with a man a few years younger than her, I loved seeing her so happy. For the first time, she truly got to travel, and she'd come back with stories of all she had seen, so grateful for the new experiences. But then her second husband died tragically, and she vowed never to marry again, the promise she kept. But no matter what, every time I walked into her condo for a visit, she always lit up with joy, hugged me, and told me she loved me. She had this way of saying, hi, honey, that made you feel like the most loved person in the room. She really listened to you. She had an ability to put aside her grief and her troubles to make whomever she was with feel like the most important person in the world. As a young adult, I lived near Graham, and we had many lunch dates at the Olive Garden. She came with me when I test drove cars in search of the first car I'd buy with my own money. She was with me for so many of my milestones, and we, met, we spent much of our time together laughing. Occasionally, I'd get reminders, though, of the deep pain that resided within her. At the birth of my niece, the moment Graham saw the brand new baby, she started crying, and her first words out were, damn you, Lou, my grandfather, the man she divorced so many years ago, now dead. The most valuable lesson I've learned from knowing my grandmother was that we can live with great pain and still experience and express great joy and love. I often wonder, with all Graham went through, how she could enjoy her life and those around her as much as she did. I've read a lot about dementia, given my experience, and I read once that it robs you of the love you felt once for the person who has it. I've thought a lot about that. Perhaps it's because my experience with the disease was shorter than some, but I never stopped loving my grandmother. You see, from her, I learned that no matter how bad things get, you just keep moving forward and you hold on to the love. <laughs>